Now, I had a chance to spend time in our schools and meet many of our educators, uh, support staff, students, uh, and parents who make this county uh, truly special in what it is. Um, when, when I look at us gathering tonight, I'm, I'm acutely aware that we have a rich diversity in terms of culture in this community. Backgrounds, perspectives, uh, I think when you have those differences, it makes you a stronger community. And that's what Prince George's County is, quite frankly. And we must not only take pride in what this diversity is, but make it a priority in shaping the educational future of our students. Now, with diversity comes the responsibility to ensure equity for all students. And equity can't just be the, the buzzword of the month or buzzword of the year. It must be a principle that truly guides every decision that we make in terms of our planning and focus uh, as we move forward to do great things for our schools. Now, as superintendent, it will be my charge to work towards equitable learning uh, and ensure that our environments and opportunities for all of our students are equitable as well. Now, last week was a good start. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to take a look, we actually moved forward to have ribbon cuttings for five brand new facilities in our community. And these are five incredible facilities from Suitland to Landover to Adelphi, Capitol Heights, and Hyattsville. These were all middle schools and all were celebrated the way we expect. And we actually have one more that will open up. In, uh, in the weeks and months to come, and I believe that's at Colin Powell Academy in Akakeek very soon. Now, this will mean six brand new schools opening this school year alone, and that'll actually affect the support of 8,000 students. Now, one of the things that I know is that while this will affect in a positive way 8,000 students, there are 8, 10, 20, 30,000 more students that really need uh, additional facilities as well. So very soon uh, we'll be moving forward under the auspice of the Blueprints program uh, to to really build additional schools and I'm very very excited for what that looks so it's, it's long overdue. I think 40 percent of our inventory is um, uh, building inventory is, is over 60 years old. Uh, that's older than me and uh, we want to make certain that we do what's best for our students. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about safety and security. Uh, in these first weeks of, uh, quite frankly, the, the new school year, I hope you've had a chance to experience and engage with our schools for, for yourself, whether it's back to school, like me as a dad had a chance to get back, or even at a PTA meeting. Uh, but just that ability and opportunity to engage, uh, in a football game, athletic event, whatever it may be. Because if you have, I believe you know, exactly what I know, despite any of the challenges and narratives that say otherwise, magic is happening in the walls of our buildings. There are great things as I look at uh, some of our parents, some of our teachers, we know that great things are happening in our buildings. Now alongside that, the highlights and excitements and new school year, we know it's been a very difficult first few weeks. Um, we've had some scenarios that have really touched my heart in a way that I wish they would not have. Uh, there's been, of course, a seamless situation at Duval High School student that we lost, Jada Madrano Moore. And just last week, there was a firearm discovered at one of our high schools and just got a call about an hour ago about a student that was near a metro stop that got a flesh wound from a bullet. Nothing life-threatening, but these are things that, from a community standpoint and a school district standpoint, that we have to pay close attention to. Now, what I will tell you as a PGCPS dad, uh, I take it personal, and tonight I want to ensure that you all know loud and clear that there is zero tolerance for fire guns, knives, or any other kind of weapons on our premises. We always tell students that if they see something, they must say something. And I'm, I'm, I'm one of those individuals as a parent that if you truly see something, we have to push others to say something. 
Now, in many cases this school year alone, harm has averted uh, students speaking up and a, a weapon or a troubled social media post. And that's one of the interesting things that has come into play in the last five to ten, ten years is social media and what, what students are going through on social media from bullying uh, to some of the really negative threats that have been out there. These are things that as a village, it's going to take us ultimately being a part of the solution to ensure the success of our students and the safety. Now, as I think about the idea of, of safety, uh, whether it's a parent, a guardian, aunt, uncle, grandparent, community members, anyone and everyone who through the diligence and attentiveness uh, and care that they may have, have the opportunity to help us prevent these kinds of scenarios. Uh, so it's ensuring that we're all involved and all connected to this work to ensure that we have the safest places uh, inside of the walls of our schools and community. Now we brought this message just last night in a community safety forum where I think we had about 1,300 people uh, that were virtually in attendance uh, to talk about it. If you didn't have a chance to, to be a part of it and hear that uh, two-hour conversation, uh, you can go out to the PGCPS YouTube channel and, and take a look and check it out. I encourage you to be a part of that conversation. We had law enforcement uh, partners, we had parents, several individuals that were a part of that. And I can assure you that the team here at PGCPS is doing their part to be a part of the solution moving forward. Now this school year, we were proactive in implementing new safety measures that were actually put in motion by our previous CEO, Monica Golson. Uh, these measures include clear backpacks at the high school level. Uh, it also includes the implementation of a uh, security plan that includes um, metal detectors. We are actually call them security enhancement uh, uh, equipment. Uh, that's going in several of our high schools and we're doing them in phases. Uh, this is just an opportunity to have an extra layer of safety uh, in our schools, but this additional technology and visibility will only be as effective as our broader collective commitment. I go back to what I said, if you see something, say something, it's important to, uh, for the community to be a part of what is happening here. Now, we also know our ongoing investments in mental health and counseling uh, are a big part of what happens moving forward. We know that uh, COVID brought us to a very different place and many of our students need support and PGCPS will continue to invest in mental health supports that really include several things from teletherapy services, uh, many of the services that you see outside and I encourage you to make certain that you take a look at the supports that we brought along with us uh, this evening. Now. I want to talk a little bit about operations as well before we get to the portion of tonight's event that allows you all to provide me with feedback. Um, another key area is really looking at our operations uh, and how they are uh, effectively moving forward. I've heard the, the challenges around transportation specifically uh, from our families, and this has really been loud and clear uh, that I've heard consistently around this particular issue. And last week, we signed a contract with an organization called Formative, that's spelled with an F, uh, M-A-T-I-V, consulting group, to help us conduct a thorough audit uh, that will include looking into everything from our hiring practices to bus routes to bail schedules to ensure that, quite frankly, we do a better job. Uh, me coming in as Superintendent, this is my 28th year. Uh, at one point in my career, I was a chief operating officer in one of the country's largest school districts. Uh, but the one thing that I know is that in order to get to a solution, you have to hear about the difficulties. And, uh, and sometimes those difficulties have to look you in the face. But my focus is going to be correcting them, and I'm looking forward to doing, the, doing so. The transportation audit will begin in September and will take about 90 days to complete. And once we receive those findings in January, we'll move forward with the implementation phase. Uh, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to presenting that information when it does come in. 
Now, in the meantime, this week we've begun to send bus route updates through our school messengers, so it's imperative that families update their contact information in the system, uh, which is, of course, the family portal. We will also continue to update um, open bus routes on individual school websites so we have a better idea of exactly when and where pickups, bus stops uh, are operating on a consistent basis as well. Now, it's critical that once you uh, can ensure our students are arriving at school on time that they are greeted by schools that are fully staffed and highly qualified in terms of the teaching ranks. And I'm committed to exploring new ways of not only attracting teachers but retaining teachers uh, at, uh, at, at the ranks that we know that they should be at. So let's switch our conversation real quick before I close out to, to finances. Now, in December, I'll be presenting the FY 2024 budget, uh, and every dollar spent must align with our commitment to equity, and you'll hear that word. Uh, our budgeting process uh, will be transparent, uh, community-driven, and really focused on supporting initiatives that advance school systems uh, and like Prince George's County, not only for the short but also for the long-term priorities that we know we have to have in place. The feedback that I hear from you all during these town halls uh, will really play a large part in shaping the spending priorities to meet the unique needs of each community within the Prince George's County Public School System. Now, I will also invite your input and collaboration specifically for the budget development process in the coming months as well, so look forward to that information. Now, uh, in closing, tonight's town hall and those to, to come about, uh, hearing from you is going to be very, very important. Your feedback is, is valued and will be the lens through which I really take a close look at the consideration of what's working and what we can do better uh, to ensure uh, that we climb the ladder of being the strongest school district in not only Maryland but in the country. As we implement the first 90 days transition entry plan that I've put together, you can expect updates from my team when we hit the important mile markers, including the operations audit that I talked a little bit about earlier. Together, we have to work and we will work towards the kind of equity, uh, ensuring that our students have the opportunity to learn at an opt optimal level. Uh, that includes school safety, operational efficiency, and the development of a budget that reflects the shared values that we all want to see for our school system. So with that being said, thank you all for being here this evening, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts, your questions, your ideas uh, as we embark on this journey towards a more in equitable and inclusive educational system in the Prince George's County Public Schools. Now, to just give everybody kind of the snapshot of what's next, this is the opportunity uh, for you all to come up to the microphone. There's a microphone in each aisle, and what you will do is um, come up, line up at the microphone. If you have comments, uh, I may or may not have a response or an answer, but we have individuals that are taking the feedback down. I have lots of individuals that are spread out throughout the auditorium. Uh, taking feedback. Uh, we actually have a section in the back uh, where we have sticky notes that we're jotting down uh, different things as well. So lots of feedback coming in. If you want to get a question uh, put in uh, that I can potentially address, you can go back and put it on the sticky and uh, we'll provide uh, an answer if possible. So if you can start making your way up to the microphones, we'll go ahead and start taking some comments uh, at this particular time. We'll go ahead and start over here. Thank you for, for joining us. You may have to hit the button. It's on. It's on. Tilt it down just a little bit. Um, you got it. Now you have to sing. I, look, I don't want to do all that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we can hear you. Just go ahead and hold it. Yeah, we're going to sing. We've got to spend some Perfect. time. Perfect. Good evening, and first of all, I want to thank you for holding this town hall and giving parents, family caregivers an opportunity just for us to be heard and voice our concerns. Um, 
with that being said, transportation is my biggest issue. And I hate to be the person to go over heads, but th that's what I've been having to do. Um, my daughter is special needs and has an IEP. Okay. By law, she is required to a bus. She does not have a bus, and my job is in jeopardy at this point right now because my daughter does not have transportation. I keep getting the runaround. I'll call transportation. They tell me one thing. The school tells me another. And it has been back and forth. She has had daycare set up since the first day of school. But she hasn't been able to attend, and that's been money down the drain trying to hold a spot because you're, you're a father, so you know child care mm -hmm. can be difficult to come by. So this has... I'm sure I'm not the only one who's in this predicament to where, okay, jobs are on the line. Um, livelihood are, is on the line. I'm in school. I'm a full-time student as well. So trying to balance all of that to better myself and my family while having to deal with the school and this transportation issue, leaving work early to get her, um, having other people put themselves in jeopardy to try to get my daughter. It's, it's been very frustrating. So, you know, I really hope that the school is looking into this to do better for their family. Yep. And I would, I would go as far, first of all, um, I, I truly want to apologize for the issues that not only you but several others had, have had from a transportation uh, standpoint. Knowing that we've had, uh, we're in a situation where we have 200 uh, bus drivers that we are short uh, of the thousands of or hundreds of bus drivers that we do have, um, we're 200 short, and that's made things very difficult. And that's one of the reasons why I uh, moved forward to uh, bring in this audit. But as a mom of a child that has special needs, your concern is now, and I completely, completely understand that. Uh, do I have anyone here from my transportation uh, department, anyone from my transportation department or operations that might be here uh, this evening. What I what I will do is I'll uh, I'll have somebody to connect with you now to get your information. Thank you. And uh, we'll take a, a close look. Uh, but this is a part of what I shared earlier uh, in terms of uh, really not taking a Band-Aid approach. I want a holistic approach at what we need to do better as a school district and then we execute on what that is. So we look forward to being a better school district from this standpoint. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank We're going to go ahead and switch to the other microphone. Yes, sir. Good evening, guys. My name is Simon Gross. Oh, sorry. Have to get a little closer to it. Good evening. Are you the superintendent? I am the, I am the superintendent. Oh, hi. My name is Brandon Flores Valencio. I am in an upper grade in Hyper High School. Welcome. Uh, my question is, why is Google Classroom disabled and Canvas are now main form of like submitting uh, classwork and other stuff? Because um, Google Classroom was perfectly fine. Canvas is utterly buggy. And one time when I was with uh, Mr. Washington, he had posted a work, but that work uh, kept not being posted. So it took like, a while for that to be posted, and by the time that happened, it was like almost time to go. So Canvas is new uh, for us. I actually used Canvas in my last two school districts where I was where I was superintendent. Uh, so the implementation stage is a is a new stage for us. Uh, what I would say is it's going to be important that you work uh, with not only your teachers but your school administration. Uh, around uh, the implementation process. So uh, I'm actually dealing with it as a father uh, as well. My, my son is, is using Canvas. We were actually on it um, just, this, uh, just, just this past last couple of days as we retrieved assignments to and then also submitted assignments. So I definitely understand where you're coming from from a standpoint of a parent uh, and a student that is, uh, is utilizing this new system. But I would say that it's important that we work closely with our school and our administration to ensure that we continue uh, with a with a implementation that will be successful. Uh, may I continue with that? Um, so I'm a part of the STEM group and esports as well. Uh, one small issue is most of our info is kept within classroom and since it's locked away, it's kind of really hard to get through all of the Google Drive stuff because all of this was 
years ago and any material that is needed for this year is now lost away and now we have to dig through all that information on the drive to get it. So why can't Classroom and Canvas exist or coexist at the same time? Because I, I, I don't mind transitioning with Canvas. Mm -hmm. It's just that I personally think Google Classroom should exist at the same time. Because even though, oh, yes, oh, uh, we can transition with Canvas to college as well, and this will prepare us for college, that is fine. But um, at the same time, Google Classroom is just more convenient and less of a pain in the butt. Okay. We'll definitely take that uh, feedback into consideration. And thank you as a student for, um, you know, stepping forward and speaking out. That's what we want to see. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll come over to the, to the other microphone. Okay, good evening. And again, congratulations on the position. Thank you. My, my daughter is currently enrolled at Scottsdale Hills, and I am a, I'm a veteran teacher actually of 10 years at the private sector. Okay. I'm very familiar with this. Um, although this is my, I went to public school, but this is my second year as far as my daughter being in public I have a couple of concerns. Okay, the first one I have is I'm looking at the, the violence that's going on in the school system. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of that y'all trying to get under control. But my concern is that as my daughter gets ready to enter into middle school after next year, because next year she'll go to fifth grade, then sixth grade, then she'll go ahead and go into middle school. Mm -hmm. That what are we doing or what are y'all doing to prepare them, not only academically, I know about academically, but socially right. to get ready to walk into that environment and also to make sure that things are secure because I don't want my daughter to enter the school, enter further into a different school, into a higher grade level, and it's not fully protected security wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, one of the things as a, as a father of a sixth grade student that, um, that I had the same questions for in, in terms of preparation for him moving to middle school is interesting because uh, one of the things that I do is visit, you know, at least five to six schools a week. Uh, and I was in an elementary school, and I was proud of what I was seeing because the, the teacher was referring to this is what it should look like in a middle school to a fifth grade class. These are, this is a sixth grade social expectation. Uh, so what I'm getting at, these are the kinds of things that, that as we scaffold up in age, fourth, fifth grade, that we should be having in terms of conversations. What we do know is that COVID really put us in a different place uh, in terms of the social fallback that many of our students took. Uh, many of the kids that are in fourth and fifth grade really missed a year and a half of that social interaction. Uh, so we're, we'll be doing our best to ensure that we pick up knowing that many of our kids uh, lost uh, quite a bit, not only academically, but socially as well. So we're taking that into consideration uh, as we plan for the future and prepare our students for the future. Okay, thank you. My, my next question is, is that, okay, as I said, my daughter came out of the private sector. And the reason why she came out of that is because of the school closed. But I the love that Say that again, the school... The, the school closed. It was a school that was open for many years, but it closed. came to a close. So she came out. Got it. And I would have left her there, but <laughs> getting it closed. So what I'm concerned about, during that time that my daughter was there, she was learning manuscripts. So she learned how to write in cursive. Mm -hmm. So when she entered in the second grade, she learned how to write in cursive. So when she entered the, um, her new school, that they said that they told her to not write yep. in cursive. And the thing is, is that, and I've come to find out that manuscript is not even being taught anymore. And the problem is, and I know some children that graduated from the high schools, from PG, from PGCPS, mm -hmm. that they're not even going to be able to sign their name. And to me, that's unacceptable. That it's okay that if they learn that they can write and print, that's great. But what about when they get older and they have to sign contracts and yep. they got to sign for a house or sign for a car? What are they going to do, print their name? Mm -hmm. So they, that's, to me, is a necessity that the children continue to learn how to write a manuscript, learn yeah. how to sign their names, and even be able to read it, because everyone is not going to write in print. Got it. Definitely. And, and what I can do, my, my chief academic officer is here, what I will share publicly is that uh, one of the things that we have to adhere to are the, 
Maryland, Maryland state standards in terms of uh, teaching expectations. But I'll have, I'll have uh, uh, Dr. Judy White to share some of the expectations with you. Uh, she'll come over and join you in, in just a second. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What I will say is because we've got a healthy uh, number of individuals that are in line, uh, if you could, uh, whether it's a comment or a question, I'll ask that uh, you um, um, practice, practice brevity so that we can get through as many people uh, as possible. I want everybody to have a chance. Uh, so, um, uh, so please practice brevity. If you have one question, we want to limit it right now to one question. And if you have an opportunity to come back later, that would be fine. But I want to have the opportunity to get to as many people uh, as possible. Uh, we will come over here and then back over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Oh, hello. Yep. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I have a concern that I wanted to share with you, and it's about the school. I have a niece and I have a grandson here in the school. Next year, another grandson is going to come here. It's about the safety. Can we turn the volume up on the microphones just a little bit? Thank you. Now, it's, it's on, but it's, we just want to turn, turn the volume up just a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can okay. hear you. It's the concern about the safety of this school. Um, when I came on the, uh, on the night for the first night and the parents have to come for the school and meet the teachers, um, I noticed that one of the doors outside, it, it, wasn't, it was locked when we came back to the building because there is some class outside. We just ring the bell on the camera and the camera is damaged. They couldn't see us. Since nobody opened the door, one of the students pulled the door from the outside and our doors open. So, you know, I want to share that they have to check the doors for the safety because mm -hmm. that's how students get a knife and drugs inside mm -hmm. of the school. Um, another thing that I wanted to, you know, put up there is that they move the metal detector in the afternoons out of, out of the place that is in the morning. I don't know if that kind of messed up the metal detectors for not detecting properly because they're continuously moving it in and out. So, um, there's a lot of things that it needs to be done in this school. A lot of students walk down the street, go to the McDonald's, losing their time out there, and it doesn't seem like anybody's pulled them inside and calling the parents, your child was outside, is not in the class, we need to have a meeting. You know, all these things have to be addressed or the problem is never going to get solved. They have to address all this. The, last year, we had a lot of problems with the fentanyl. A lot of kids die here. And, you know, I have grandkids, I have my niece, mm -hmm. another grandchild. Everybody have kids here that they love and they care about it. So their safety is something that is the first. Absolutely. So, you know, they have, to, they have to check the door. That's why things get inside the school, because the outside doors can be pulled from the outside. So that's my main concern that I have, that I notice it. And they need to check the cameras. Some of the cameras are not working. And I would completely agree. Earlier when I, when I opened, I talked about if you see something, say something. And I appreciate you say, saying something. I think it's just as important to share that with the administration at your school when you have a concern as well. Um, you're right. Um, we have to practice consistent procedures from a safety standpoint in order to ensure that the safety and well-being of our staff and students happens on a consistent basis. Uh, so definitely appreciate that. What's, what was the school again? It's this school, High okay. Point. High Point. Yes, and okay. another thing that about see something and say something, I mean, you have staff in the school, you have teachers, mm -hmm. you have people who work in here, and... And it's impossible. They don't see these kids walking like they zombies, like they on drugs. They should be sent to the nurse and ask the parents to pick them up and run a test because they're under the influence of something. So they need to find out what is going on, how do they get it. But nobody's doing anything. They smell weeds on the hallways. They are smoking weed in the bathrooms, but nobody see. And they in here. So, you know, they want the kids to be pointing. Oh, I saw this. I saw mm -hmm. that. And then... A couple of days later, they get beat up, they get sent to the doctor, the emergency room, and, and that's not fair because there is grown people over here that they can't talk to. They well, can't I, say anything to. What I will say is that regardless of, 
uh, rep- it's, it's important to address it uh, regardless. Uh, so whether that's in writing, uh, as the adult, if you feel like it's uh, your place versus the child, it's important to, to still say something regardless. So those concerns are not just school concerns or community concerns, and we want to address them. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. Thank good you evening. so much. I just want to first off really thank you for this opportunity. It's been my experience so far as a parent in this district that it's been really difficult to speak directly to officials. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what's wrong with the mic, but I'm, I'm really appreciative um, to be able to have this opportunity. Um, I'm here as a parent of an elementary set of elementary school students. Um, for me as a parent, it's really important that they develop a love of learning over the the course of their life, Um, that they see school as a safe place that's fun, that they can take risks, that um, for them it's it's not a matter of whether or not, you know, it's an A, B, C, or D type of environment, that they're here to to learn and be nurtured and thrive. Um, My question is around the grading system. There's a lot of research that indicates that how our grading system has traditionally worked really impacts student engagement, Mm -hmm. student belonging, identity, mental health. Um, And this increases as students get up, you know, towards secondary school and the stakes become higher. Um, I've also noticed that traditional grading practices tend to result in less inspired teaching um, and resulting in in environments that really don't feel nurturing um, and don't feel like students are able to be creative and take risks. Um, So my question is whether the district is going to be examining the traditional grading policy. Um, I was really cheered to see that the mission involves 21st century competencies and skills. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, that aligns directly with a grading system that speaks to a learning progression and a learning continuum. Um, So we'd love your thoughts on what the work is moving forward. Yep. I feel like this would fundamentally change the culture of teaching and learning. Now, one of the things, and thank you for the question, one of the things that uh, we philosophically took a shift with uh, just this year, just recently, is aligning uh, better to uh, other school districts around us. What we were seeing is that uh, whether students were transferring in or transferring out, because we were drastically different in terms of how we operated, that it made it difficult uh, for our scholars. Uh, So we recently made that philosophical shift uh, to ensure that we had better alignment uh, with uh, with school districts that are around us. So uh, I don't know if you were aware of that, but that shift was was made recently for specifically that reason. I, I think right now I'm in a situation where I'm looking at how um, the Board of Education has said grades need to be determined. And so if we're saying a certain percentage has to be assigned to classwork, a certain percentage, you know, is like homework or, mm-hmm. you know, assessments, and all of these measures are not necessarily tied to whether a student knows or can do. Um, they feel very artificial and irrelevant to a student's learning progression over the years. I see where you're coming from. We will definitely take that conversation. Uh, we'll take your, your concern into consideration, and we'll, we'll note it as we uh, go into some of our academic conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I do want to, before we move forward, um, the light is bright, but I saw a, a few of our board members come in. If, uh, if At this time, if uh, we can just have my board members to stand, I see our board chair, I see Jocelyn Rout, I see a couple of others as well. Let's give them a big hand for being here uh, and the work uh, that they do. Thank you all. See Zippor and Pam. Thank you all for being here. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Muy buenas tardes, maestro. Eh y padres de familia, es un verdadero placer conocerlo. Eh, tengo un jovencito aquí en esta escuela, mi pregunta o más que todo es preocupación. El día, de, el día lunes, uh, perdón, el día martes, llegó mi niño con un severo dolor de cabeza, eh, fue, como se llama, provocado por el exceso de humo en los baños, y pues este que hiciera saber cuáles son las estrategias para esos jóvenes que no están involucrados en las drogas y que de una y otra forma ese humo les molesta a ellos 
o cuáles podrían ser las probabilidades de hacer más baños para esos jóvenes que no están eh, exceso a tocar drogas o, o más bien evitarlos que, que no estén al alcance de todo eso. Me gustaría saber cuál sería la estrategia que tienen para esos jóvenes sanos que tenemos. Lamentablemente hay eh, más jóvenes que acceden a esto, pero estamos eh, preocupados porque um, tenemos jóvenes y tenemos niños en casa. A mí por lo particular me molesta el humo, pero eh, me gustaría saber si tienen alguna estrategia para evitar eso. Muchas gracias. Okay, I'm the interpreter. Uh, well, she said good afternoon to all the teachers, all the parents. Uh, so uh, she comes today to talk about a uh, uh, teenager who she has, and she said uh, she was talking about an experience that happened in which her uh, uh, this Tuesday her her son came home and he came home with like a severe headache, mm -hmm. and it was caused from like the smoke or the smoke smell uh, that was in the bathrooms that he used. And she was just basically asking what are uh, the things that are put in place or what can be done to like uh, reduce the smoke smell that are in the bathrooms uh, from mm. other teenagers who are probably doing drugs or doing th things they shouldn't be doing in the bathroom. Uh, what are different things that are put in, being put in place or being planned to be put in place? Uh, because we know that there are some students who get affected by that smell or by that smoke. And we know that not all the teenagers or not all the students are do drugs. Uh, but there are some students who are affected by it, um, including her. She says that the smoke uh, gives her like headaches, makes her feel uh, uh, bad. So she was wondering if there's anything being put into place or any like ideas, perhaps like having a uh, bathroom specifically pro uh, for students who don't do drugs or like a way or a way to like divide the students because you know that not all the students do drugs. Some do, unfortunately. But she was wondering what, what are the things that are being put into place or what can be done to avoid that? Well, we, we definitely will not be separating the idea of uh, users and not users. There's no tolerance for, uh, for, as I mentioned earlier, firearms, weapons, drugs in our schools. Uh, so it kind of goes back to ensuring that uh, our administration is, is uh, aware. Uh, we can, uh, I'd like for her, if you don't mind, taking down her school and um, uh, uh, that concern so that we can have it addressed here. Okay, we will uh, make that loud and clear heard uh, with the administration to, uh, to ensure that the, uh, the concern is heard and addressed. Yes, ma'am, I had a chance to meet you earlier, didn't I? Good to see you. Do you Start over one time. How effective do you since I go to High Point High School? Is go ahead. So, so she said, how effective do we truly believe the metal detectors are? She goes to High Point High School and two metal detectors, only two metal detectors. Every, there's only two entrances. So two entrances with metal detectors. Okay. So our question is, how effective do we truly think there are? Uh, can students, you know, slip out through another exit uh, or use another exit or entrance uh, when we're trying to keep things down to the two that have been established? That's the idea, uh, is to have uh, controlled entrance uh, to minimize what we see uh, in terms of students coming into, into our buildings. We feel like the effectiveness works, uh, and we feel like that in these kinds of scenarios, um, schools have to develop their own plans, and that's a part of what we're seeing. Each school has a little bit different plan. You may have one school that because of the design of the building, you can only have one entrance. Uh, and I'll give you an example. At one high school specifically because of that design, they're, they're having kids come in one door and that uh, naturally would create kind of a bottleneck. So they allow, are now allowing students to come into the building 
15 or 20 minutes earlier. So they'll have time, won't be late to classes. Uh, but uh, that controlled entrance, uh, points of access, that's extremely important. Uh, if we do see scenarios, again, see something, say something. Let administration know. Uh, that this may be occurring so that we can only get better over the course of time. But I appreciate, like the other young man uh, spoke up, anytime we have a student that, uh, that comes before a microphone in front of adults, we always want to thank them uh, and appreciate them. But thank you for your, your, uh, your feedback, and we'll take that in. What was the school again? Here, High Point High School. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Taylor. I am a retired HR from a DC public charter school, one of the largest in DC. I have children in Montgomery County Public Schools, Paint Branch specifically, and Prince George's County Public Schools, uh, Bowie High School and Samuel Ogle. <laughs> My question, of course, <laughs> okay, but, um, I have been fingerprinted and background checked and, I'm get, and to volunteer mm -hmm. in schools. I have a skill set. I have a, it's so different. It's different like night and day between Montgomery County and Prince George's County. It feels like Prince George's County is trying to keep the parents out of school. I don't understand that and I hope that you can give me some clarity on that. That's thing number one. Thing number two, um, I know master teachers who have left the Prince George's County Public School. And you can look up the names and who's who of teachers in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Paulette Tillman is listed in there, oh my God, for 10 or 12 years going. And it's not that she's tired of teaching. It's because of the directives that have come from Maxwell, and I think she left before Goldston. But um, she is a science teacher and a math teacher. She, her last job was at uh, uh, Annapolis Road Academy, Academy Adult Education. She was told that she had to teach these adults algebra. And any teacher worth her or his or her salt will find out what you don't know before they start in on a new lesson. It was uh, her administrator, when she called it to the administrator's attention, that she had to teach the basic arithmetic. The teacher told her, I mean, excuse me, the administrator told her, no, you teach what they said. And if you don't teach what they said, you can, you know, you don't have a job. That is not the first time I've heard that from a teacher in Prince George's County. And I hope that you address that. Uh, last but certainly not least, just piggybacking off a comment, as retired HR, cursive writing is needed mm -hmm. because I've gone to several HR conventions and those folks, if you can't sign your name, you ain't gonna get no job. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. I'm done, I'll see you this week. Thank, thank you for your <laughs> comments and, and concerns, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Hi, this is what, okay, good. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Debbie Ann Camp, and I'm here with a contingent um, of parents mm -hmm. from Heightsville Elementary, which is one of the schools that is part of the Phase 2 P3 funding package. Mm -hmm. This is a package of schools that are desperately in need of being rebuilt. And as you know, the contract was not approved at last week's BOE meeting. And frankly, this was because of politics. Delaying this contract will put the rebuild of our school that desperately needs it at risk. It will also risk the two schools with students who are currently in swing spaces because their buildings mm -hmm. are too structurally unsafe for children to be inside. And two elementary schools whose construction will alleviate the overcrowding at Beltsville Elementary. And also by meaning longer use of the available swing space, it will threaten the rebuild of High Point. So my question is how will you as a leader make sure that tomorrow night the contract is approved so that phase two of this national model that has been proven to be effective and is the only way we have to rebuild the schools will proceed. We've, we've been working in, in everything that you said 
is accurate. There is a major need uh, in our school district. And uh, as a former chief operating officer and superintendent in, in two other school districts, uh, I've gone through the process. And there's a very unique process in the Prince George's County uh, partnership uh, that uh, we, we have in place. Uh, as a leader, uh, we've been on the phone with uh, several individuals to ensure that we get this done tomorrow, and I'm confident that we'll get it done. Okay, I will say that we've been on the phone with Excellent. more than several individuals for the entire week. Excellent. And so I would hope to hear that it's more than several and that, yes, tomorrow night you will do what has to happen in front of the cameras with the politics of the board and lead and make sure that this that is a long time coming. Is We're approved. looking forward to a positive result. Excellent. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I just have one basic question. I have a younger sibling that goes to Cavaton Elementary School, and there has been recent changes when it comes to buses. Uh, for the past couple months when she's come to school, she was supposed to get home at 225, 230. There was an instance where she got home at 3 o'clock, at 3.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. And each time I've called the, the school, they've always said, oh, the bus is coming, wait a 10 minutes, and she's never there. And there's no way I can know where she's at. I don't have any communication with mm -hmm. her. I don't know what she's doing, anything that's happening, and I can't figure out where she's at, if she's, where she's going, when she's coming home. I just want to ask, when is that going to get fixed? Because when she comes home, I come, I'm supposed to come home at... 225, my school ends at 225. When yep. I get home, she's usually there. But this instance, she's not there. It's an hour and a half later. I'm waiting at the bus stop. She's not there. She comes home. She's like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. I'm so tired. It was the last bus that came. The, the, uh, the bus stop, the bus, um, the bus driver was so mean to us because she was so tired. And I just wonder, when is that going to get fixed? Because she's a smaller child. Mm -hmm. so she doesn't really know what she's supposed to do if something happens. What grade is your sister in? She's in third grade. So she doesn't really know what's happening. It's her first time going to a PG County school. So what I can say is that your sister is extremely lucky to have an advocate uh, in you to, uh, to step, step forward, to be in a venue, um, venue like this. Uh, as I indicated, there are some challenges uh, with our buses, knowing that we have 200 bus drivers that are short, and we are working uh, every day to, to get better. Uh, it's important that we communicate, of course, with the school, uh, our bus hotline, uh, so that we, uh, so that they know that there still may be an issue. Sounds like about a 30-minute gap in terms of when she is supposed to be home or the projected time uh, that um, uh, that you guys have been given. Uh, so it's important that we communicate that uh, with the, uh, the with the school to make certain that we hopefully uh, get to a place where this is corrected. Again, we are going through a more holistic uh, uh, audit uh, to take a close look at what we need to do differently, and we'll be executing on, on what those differences are. But again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being an advocate for your sister uh, as well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Christine Soto. And I have two children that come to this school, High Point High School. Um, and I have two questions. The first one is um, in relation to the smaller renovations that, that maybe could happen here at this school. I know that we are on the plan for another building in the future. Um, but even if you just do a walk around of the school, you can see windows, um, you can see blinds needing be, needed to be replaced, you can see our baseball field needs to mm -hmm. be uh, taken care of, um, and painting, I mean, just little things like that. Is that a part of High Point's budget or is that the county's budget to just take care of those smaller renovations yep. that could help make the school look better and the kids feel better about coming here? Th those are typically called uh, items of deferred maintenance. And I don't know what the exact dollar amount, but I can tell you that it's in the millions uh, of dollars. And what deferred maintenance is, is that because there have been major priorities, HVAC, uh, old boilers, things that have to be addressed, unfortunately, there are things that have to go on the back burner, the deferred maintenance list. Um, so uh, I'd have to take a close look at, uh, you know, our, what exactly our deferred maintenance. There are certain things that 
the school can take care of in their budget. But quite frankly, uh, these are things that uh, should be taken care of at the district level. And that's why, you know, the P3 and that's why uh, what we're doing in terms of building schools is so incredibly important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, an array of schools that are just too old. And so we're going to be playing catch up for quite some time. Uh, and unfortunately, in some instances, we'll be putting quite a bit of money from a deferred maintenance standpoint into buildings that we know eventually uh, will, uh, that will be transitioning out of our inventory at some point. But we have to keep them going. Um, but some of it can be done at the school level, and some of it is probably caught up on deferred maintenance lists because there are other priorities uh, that may be health related, uh, that may be heating and air uh, related that we have to focus on first. So what school was it again? This school, High Point High School. High Point High School, yes. got it. Um, and so in relation to that, um, I do think that um, PGCPS needs to take a look at the administration here um, because yes, we need to look at our budget to see if there's things that we can fix, you know, ourselves mm -hmm. here, right? Um, but like other parents here mentioned, this school has a big drug problem. Um, the kids are walking around like zombies. There are kids here walking like that. Mm -hmm. my, son, my son tells me on a daily basis. Um, and there are bathrooms that smell. There's hallways that smell. Mm -hmm. There's stairwells that smell. Um, and I wanted to know, is there a way that someone can come here and do a thorough assessment of the school of the children, of the administration, what, we're, what they're doing to stop the drugs from either coming in or at least stop them from using yep. at, on school grounds and stop them from skipping. Is, can we hire more security guards or can we train the security guards mm -hmm. better to be able to deal with this type of problem here? Um, I, I spoke at the last board meeting, at one of the last board meetings, and I, I, I shared that on social media, there's a photo of a, a security guard picking up a child and, and slamming him against the, the lockers here at this school. And so there, there's some kind of training, there's sensitivity that needs mm -hmm. to happen here. Um, and I would very much like to know if there's a plan for this school to be examined. So one of areas. the things, because it's, you know, the, the drug usage is, uh, that we've seen uh, in our community uh, is reflective of what we we're seeing in our schools. We've had a couple of uh, overdoses, uh, over, and luckily enough, of because overdoses. of Narcan, we've been able to save, mm -hmm. save those students' lives. Uh, but it's going to be important moving forward, and I've actually set up time with um, uh, some very influential uh, faith-based leaders and law enforcement uh, folks within the next week or so to start this conversation of what we can do better. Because this is not just a high point issue. It's a community issue, and uh, this issue is in other schools. So we're starting that conversation to determine what we can do better. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, it's a reflection. Uh, you know, overdoses are up in our community. And now they're up in our schools as well. So we'll be pushing forward to, uh, to take a close look at what we can do better. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. And my concern is, um, well, first I want to commend PGCPS for the efforts that you all have taken in keeping students safe with the metal detectors and the SROs and all the other um, efforts that you guys have put into place. However, I do want to bring to your attention that uh, there are other safety concerns mm -hmm. that are not only physical, um, social, psychological, mm -hmm. emotional. And at my child's school, she's at Mount Rainier Elementary School, there has been- You said Mount Rainier Elementary School? Mount Rainier, yes, elementary okay. school. Um, we're new there. We just started at the end of last year. Okay. And I've discovered that there's a culture of racism and discrimination going on in the school. Um, it's not isolated incidences. Mm -hmm. There have been many, many, many incidences of the small number of black students being called the N-word, um, being told that their hair was like Harriet Tubman's, being told that they need to uh, clean the counters because they're their slaves. Um, that's to start off with. Okay. And as a 
different um, to see the kind of hurt and the kind of damage that it, it does to your child mm -hmm. and, and her level of um, desire and success at the school is very disheartening. Um, I know that these kinds of things are going to happen. We don't live in a perfect world, mm -hmm. especially in a time in which we're in right now. Um, it seems to be more blatant and more prevalent. However, I believe that it's leadership's responsibility. You guys have the authority to make sure that policies and procedures are put into place to make sure that things like this gets better. And it doesn't become a part of the culture because it's be due to lack of acknowledgement, due to lack of consequences, due to um, the lack of really, really handling it in the way it needs to be handled. There's, there are policies and procedures for bullying, but the discrimination is not necessarily considered underneath that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's getting, um, it's being handled with a light-handed approach. And as a result of that, it's growing and it's becoming a part of the culture there. It's a problem. Well, there it's, is, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there's, there's no room for uh, racism. There's no room. Um, we're, we're in a society now of, uh, when we talk about equity, uh, we talk about, uh, you know, tolerance as well for different communities, different races, different eth ethnic, um, 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 you know, different religions. So uh, that kind of tolerance is something that we need to be focusing on. So please know that I, I have folks here. I know my chief of schools is listening now, and we will take a look uh, specifically at, uh, at your concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity to provide you feedback. And uh, I, um, I guess as you travel, my name is Magali Salas, and I live in the Adelphi area. And here's my uh, spoke children in this school. Um, as you travel throughout the area, you will get pretty much the same narrative which is rundown facilities, mm -hmm. um, the narrative that Prince George's County uh, public school system does not measure up, especially to the one in Montgomery County, and a history of school funds diverted to other county priorities. Basically, if I can, I mean, I will sum it up for you. This is the narrative, you know, throughout the years. So uh, what happened last Thursday at the board's um, meeting was appalling because here you have a fantastic program that makes Prince George's County the first in the nation mm -hmm. to be, that is able to build schools so fast in such wonderful facilities and politics got in the way. So um, I, I certainly um, hope that, as you stated before, that you become an advocate, a strong advocate for this program, because it is the program that's going to carry all of these concerns forward, that's going to answer those things. But in particular regard to High Point, in particular, this school, I wanted to uh, make, uh, provide you some feedback. This school is special especially because it is in the northern part of the county that is really, really close to Montgomery County, so the comparison is, you know, there. The overcrowding in this school is appalling, close to 3,000 students, uh -huh. okay? My grandson, my grandson was late for class today, and you know what he said to the teacher? There was too much traffic to get here. He meant the students in the hallways that he was not able to get there, uh -huh. all right? The other thing is that this is a special community. It is a very diverse community. It is mostly Hispanics, and our families have a lot of issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. They have difficult family circumstances. Some of them work two or three jobs to make it, make it uh, um, possible. They have no, they provide, they, they're not able to provide support to the students. They have financial difficulties, so basically, the school becomes, has to be the community right. for these students. And at this point in time, this facility 
does not provide the educational environment for them to want to come here and to learn. Now, I'm very happy that High Point, once again, is on the books in the CIP, right? Yep. In two areas, a full-scale renovation of this building mm -hmm. and also the, the construction of a new yes. high school. That certainly will alleviate all of these problems that I, you know, that I mentioned. <clears throat> but the history of that is also that. High Point appears on papers and then all of a sudden it disappears because the funds go away to something for something else. I would like to know um, that you will become an advocate for this school. It is important, mm -hmm. it is critical. Yeah. Our students, our families cannot wait much longer. We are on track. Your staff has been extraordinary, extraordinary in coming up with a plan. And I would like to know whether we have your support to get this done. So what I, what I can tell you is that um, I've heard you loud and clear. And not only does High Point have my support, but the, the other schools that are 50, 60 years old that have major uh, construction and issues in terms of deferred maintenance have my support uh, as well. We want to get this done. We want to ensure that we have the kind of learning environments that allow our students uh, to be proud, allow our communities to, to be proud, uh, because there's a major difference. When I walked into the five new middle schools that recently opened, it was interesting to see the almost a chip on the shoulder of the students that walked in that building. Mm -hmm. And we want all of our buildings that are much too old, 50, 60 years old, that haven't had the opportunity to have the kind of TLC that they deserve. We want all of them to have that support. So you ask if I have uh, if, if, if this school has my support, of course. Uh, but it's, it's, it's about all of our students because we're in a situation where we've waited way too long and we want to see this uh, be pushed down the road in the manner that we expect and want. Wonderful. Our governor has said that no one should be left behind. Mm -hmm. That is our governor talking. And so I, don't, your words are encouraging. High Point should not be left behind again. Well, as... As your superintendent, as your superintendent, my goal and responsibility is to ensure that no, none of our students are left behind and none of our schools are left behind. So we can get this done together. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Superintendent House. Dr. Hi. Suzanne Windsor, pupil personnel worker, Duval High School, Dora Kennedy French Immersion, Catherine T. Reed, and Glendale Elementary School. And listening to the parents this evening and the students, what I've noted is a common theme. Teacher working conditions are the learning conditions for our students. The recruitment and retention of educators, counselors, pupil personnel workers, school psychologists, and other Unit 1 staff is paramount to both the academic success and the safety of our babies. Students, would you please expound upon your plan to ensure for transparency in the bargaining process as well as plans to adequately bolster the recruitment and retention of educators while keeping an eye to inclusivity in the promotion process? That was about, that was about 11 questions, uh, and, and you, you, you kept it brief, uh, but that's an art that, uh, that you just... But what I did here is especially about recruitment, uh, retaining of our, of our teachers, which has been a big, big issue, um, not only in Prince George's County, but really quite across the country. Uh, as I mentioned, in my 28 years, I've had a chance to spend time uh, in uh, some of the largest school districts in the country, in Charlotte and Houston, uh, here, uh, as well as uh, a mid-sized school district in Tennessee. And um, even before COVID, what we saw is the flight of many people away from public education. And even before public education, we started to see the flight uh, from our colleges of education, quite frankly. And it's something that there's a major struggle with. And in many instances across the country, what we've seen is that those colleges of education that are producing teachers, they're typically producing teachers uh, that are uh, not of color and in small numbers. 
So we've had to take a different stance in public education and in the Prince George's County in how we look at this and address it. One of the things that we're looking at is really that, that process four to five years before we hire a teacher. How can we grow and develop some of our own? So there's been a lot of effort put into, you know, how can we find high school teachers? Actually, this past weekend, I was supposed to be speaking to a large group of high school students at the University of Maryland that have an interest of being teachers. Those are the kinds of things that we have to do and put them on a track uh, that allows them to eventually have opportunities to uh, have you know, their college education paid for an apprenticeship, uh, which is something that we're thinking through as well. Uh, we also have to look at those individuals that are in the profession, but not in certificated or certified positions uh, as well, which is a part of our plan in Grow Your Own. Are there individuals that are in paraprofessional positions, other support positions, where life might have gotten in the way uh, for them to move forward and get their certification? We have to grab those individuals. We also have to grab those graduating seniors, juniors and seniors, and encourage them into the profession. And those are some of the things that we're focusing on uh, as we move forward to improve the numbers uh, and the retention uh, statistics that we know we want to move forward with as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Good evening, um, Superintendent. Thank you for uh, coming out here tonight to listen to us. Um, I have two children at Hyattsville Elementary School, one in fourth grade, one in first grade. I myself am a graduate of uh, PGCPS. I went to Northwestern High School. Okay. Um, as you've heard from many of the parents tonight, the um, condition of many of the schools in the county, in particular this region of the county, is in bad shape. When I went to Northwestern, it was a brand new school when it first opened, and I think after a month we had portable buildings that blocked the basketball court. Mm -hmm. If you go to Nicholas Oran Middle School, there are portable buildings all over the softball field. Um, so last Thursday, it was very disappointing to see um, the feckless leadership of the board members that are trying to torpedo the, the P3 uh, phase two funding. It, they're failing our children and they should really be ashamed of themselves. So I'm really happy to hear that um, you'll be supporting the next phase of funding. Um, and I wanna highlight some of the problems facing our kids specifically mm -hmm. at Hyattsville Elementary. <clears throat> There's been sewage in kindergarten classrooms. There have been pipes that have burst and have closed school. Uh, the kids, com my kids complain every day about the, the HVAC being too hot. They don't even want to wear their coats on the coldest day of winter because it's so hot in the school. There's inadequate parking for the staff at the mm -hmm. school. Luckily, there's a handshake agreement with a church next door, but if they decide to pull their parking, right. the staff has no parking. The option then is to close the playground and the kids won't have anywhere to play. So I hope we have your support in passing the f phase two of the P3 funding. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. We appreciate you. Hello. Hello, Superintendent. Hi, I am Dr. Tung. I'm here at High have Point High Have you talked right School. into that microphone? I will. I'm here at High Point High School. I would like to first of all congratulate Mr. Chacon. This is one of our vice principals. He's the number two in the building who has been running our building very well for the last week and what? For the last two weeks. And I just want to, you know, congratulate him on doing a wonderful job while our principal is away, taking care of some family matters. And I want the parents to understand he loves your children and he's here to do anything possibly that he can, but however, he needs you to be accountable for your child as well. Although we hear eight hours with your child, you still have to help us. It's a community, and we can't do everything alone. So I just want to congratulate Mr. Chacon, who does a wonderful job running this building of 3,000 students with that bullhorn and writing them up and calling parents. It is, it is definitely definitely a village and we definitely appreciate our teachers and administrators and parents as well it's a village of working together yes ma'am good evening 
Can you hear me? Superintendent House, welcome to Prince George's County. Welcome to my hometown, my alma mater, which my alma mater high is 69 years old. You know, when our bodies hit 69 years, <laughs> they like need to be replaced. <laughs> and, and, and parent or the grandparent who asked about, but you know, doing a little fixing, Superintendent House, I'm a community advocate. I have been volunteering in this community my entire life, 40 years as a volunteer. I was the feasibility chairperson for a new high point. We were supposed to have that in 2017. I have watched them kick this can down the road for 30 years. To everyone in this audience, I need you to reach out to your friends, your neighbors, and tell them to bombard the school board members for their shameful action yes. because they not only did they screw, potentially screw High Point, they have screwed the children in the northern part of the county. The schools in the northern part of the county have been the most overcrowded schools going back 15 years. Oh, by the way, I don't have any kids, but the kids in these schools uh, they're all my children, and I am so fed up with the lackadaisical political BS that these politicians play. So please, to the audience, reach out and bombard them. It is time for all of the schools in the P3 to be built. It is not fair to the children, and, you, and somebody was talking about what this building looks like. You pull up into, I don't know how these kids, the staff, where did it go? It's there. Okay. Um, You're there. It was like a high school in the ghetto. But unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I am not going to ask you to do a Band-Aid because God forbid if this school gets another Band-Aid, it'll be 2040 or some other lame excuse that they'll push it out to. My other concern is I, I actually interact with a lot of teenagers and one of the teenagers who was doing yard work for me, right before school started, I asked him, I said, how do you feel about school? Uh -huh. And do you know what he said to me? He said, Mama Bear, I hope we don't have as many drug overdoses this year as we did last year. And I was like, just take a knife and stab me uh -huh. in the heart. And this young man is a student here at High Point. So drug situation has to come under control and the safety, it's not just the safety of the students, but it is the safety of the teachers and the staff here. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And the, the truancy was brought up. Y'all need to also reach out and reach out to the state's attorney, Aisha Brave Boy, and say, why are you not dealing, why are you not enforcing the truancy laws that are on the books? These kids belong in school. Great. Thank you, ma'am. So, Welcome to the community. I will say to you what I said to, to Monica when she became chairperson or CEO. God bless you because it's not an easy job and I don't know how to do it. But anyway, thank, thank you, you, Mama Bear. <laughs> we appreciate you. Yes, sir. Oh, awesome. All right, Superintendent House, uh, thanks for holding this. It's a chance to learn more from our stakeholders. Much appreciated, sir. So, uh, Lou, I'm Mr. Sheriff Nigabisi. I teach here at High Point, uh, technology education. I'm the department chair. I co-sponsor the STEM club, I help with the robotics and the esports program, I do a bunch of stuff around here. And I get it, school, uh, school system is a lot of problems, like with uh, the, the, the drug abuse and the funding and the infrastructure and the construction of new schools, the security. Uh, I, I know one teacher got attacked by a student, a uh, student got together with friends to conspire false reports that it was a teacher who was violent. And then even though other students reported the truth months ago, the teacher is still fighting those charges. I get it. We have a bunch of problems. Some of them with effective solutions will take complex solutions, right? How are we supposed to trust you and the other district leaders when you can't even get simple solutions going? Uh, one of my students in the STEM club, Brandon here, talked about Canvas, right? Uh, so we started the STEM club uh, three, four years ago. Our Google Classroom is resources from the original members of the robotics team. Now, now Brandon can't look back at those records anymore. He has to count on me until eventually I get kicked out of it. Uh, we, we have one student from the original founding members 
God bless him. Kid got held back a year. But uh, watch. But looking at the old messages from his old friends who started the program, uh, helped him redouble his efforts. Now he's helping out, out, out the robotics program proper. How can we solve all these big complex problems, complex solutions? Can't even get on board with a simple solution like let us choose between Google Classroom versus Canvas. And it's not like I don't know how to use Canvas. I used it for two years when we originally rolled it out. I just know its limitations and I know how you can't treat every problem like it's a nail and hit everything with hammers. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> so what I will say is number one, thank you for what you do on a daily basis as, a, as an educator and as a teacher. But I will also say in terms of, I heard you use the word trust. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is near and dear to, to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be new to this community, but trust means a lot. And that's why I'm here today. I don't necessarily have to be here, but it's important for me to hear from the community. Because I know the community, the school, knows what's going on, and I need to hear those things. So I'm here to establish trust, to bring us closer to the kinds of things that we want in our schools and the things that we don't want in our schools. Uh, so again, thank you for your passion, uh, your words, and we look forward to building that trust over the course of time. All right. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. So, heads up, I'm in communication with PGCPST3, see if we can get some solutions going, but, you know, uh, like Brandon said, if, if, if we can't get it to cook, we, we might need to make some adjustments. So, awesome. Uh, thank, thank you for you. your time, sir. What I will say also, if uh, we're going to take these last uh, one, two, three, four, five, six questions before we close out, we want to make sure that each individual that uh, is standing currently at our microphones has the opportunity to make comments or provide questions. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you so much. My name is Tanya Fuentes. I am a mother of five, a class of 23 High Point graduate, senior this year, who is not at High Point this year, uh, who I withdrew and took to a private school this year. Mm -hmm. I have one child at MLK and two at Vansville Elementary. Um, first of all, before I say anything else, where did Rebecca Garcia go? I have seen Rebecca Garcia and Miguel Chacon put their safety at risk. Their body has been in danger. I have been here for the last four years, almost on a daily basis in the morning and afternoon. Both of my boys were athletes here. My son is actually at a, on a scholarship for soccer out of High Point, and I'm grateful for that. I miss High Point, but my child, who is now a senior's mental health, was very affected last year. There is, and I don't know if this is gonna come out as a question maybe, but my concern is that over the last four years, the teacher retention went down. I saw some of the best teachers just walk out and never come back. I saw Dr. Amelia Simmons leave over this summer. She ran the counseling office and she was a mentor and she was a leader in this building and she left. Kalel Statham, the football coach who had promises at this school, left and left 55 boys on the football team behind. And it wasn't because he wanted to, it was because he could not handle what was going on in this building. So I want to know, as a parent, because I am upset when I make my monthly mm -hmm. tuition payment to this new private school, because I feel that PGCPS has failed my son, what are you guys doing to retain these amazing teachers? I know someone already asked it. To retain these amazing coaches, and I'm going to include Coach Tung because she coached my son as well. My son did soccer, swimming, lacrosse. Lacrosse disappeared. Why? Because these kids do not want to spend more time here, and there's no adults who are really staying besides the handful of coaches. The football team barely made it back up this year. So my son's football scholarship or being able to be recruited was at risk, and I had to make a difficult choice. I, I'm a community advocate. I brought 200 Narcan kids here from community donations, and instead of give, getting a thanks, I was scolded for speaking about High Point's business 
uh, to or, uh, private organizations. Well, let, so, let me be the first to say thank you for your advocacy and thank you for your support of this community. If no one said it, I'm saying it now uh, because it's obvious that the passion bleeds through you. Um, I hate to hear that uh, the mental health of, uh, of your child uh, has been compromised and you felt as a mother that you needed to step away from uh, from from and the school. I was so not I given an option. I'm, I had I to. I want to provide you with an with, with an answer, uh, and I also want to provide the others with an opportunity to to speak as well in a timely manner. So what I will say is that we take seriously the recruitment and retention. It's something that is lifted up as a priority uh, already. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on currently with uh, with my board is. How, how the board evaluates me. And this is one of the things that I want to be held accountable for and evaluated for. Uh, so it's something that I have lifted up as, as, a, uh, as an opportunity to show that we're growing in the right direction. So we're developing that tool as we speak. Uh, but we're also working, as I mentioned earlier, around you know whether it's teacher pay, which there was a commitment by a board uh, this past year to improve our, our teacher pay uh, to all the different things that go along with improving culture uh, as well. So we want to continue to grow. Uh, as a new superintendent, I'm committed uh, to doing it. Uh, whether it's been inherited or not, uh, we're looking forward to getting better as we move forward. I appreciate, appreciate that, Mr. House. Just one, one last piece of information that I think is crucial to know. There's a dozen kids that have left High Point to other schools for the same reasons. The child that was killed at Duval was here at High Point last year. Her family made the same decision I did. And my family is blessed to be able to be in a circumstance where I can pay tuition, but there's so many others. High Point deserves better. High Point has the largest ESL population in the state, has one of the most lowest income uh, uh, average in the whole state. Let's not leave this population behind. Absolutely. There is kids that have interrupted education. There are kids that uh, do not have parents. There are kids that are here alone. And we need help in this building. The administrators are not enough. They need help. I have seen Miguel Chacon. I have seen him be in the middle of group fights. Mm -hmm. He's on TikTok, believe it or not, because he's always there. <clears throat> and so their safety, it's not fair. I was told by one of the police officers outside last year, they couldn't bring dogs because there was so much drugs in this building that if they brought dogs, the dogs would die. So my kid is supposed to call me every day to use the restroom so I can come and pick him up and drive him home because he didn't want to use the restroom here. So these are facts that you have to collect because there's something very broken and High Point deserves better. And that's why we're here um, to, to hear the concerns. And your concerns have been heard loud and clear. Thank you for being here. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Superintendent. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to do one little thing with the, when she said something about the um, buses. I work in Howard County and they have a, it's everywhere, the bus issue. Don't think it's only PG. What we did at some of our schools is we pushed back the time of mm -hmm. the school. I know that may not be great Bell for schedules. a lot of the parents, but we also have before and after school that we have um, financing and waivers. Most of the kids go for free to the before and after school because the parents can't drop them off. A lot of these buses do double runs. So the early high yep. school students, they get the first run push back the elementary and middle school, and it's working, to be honest with you. They also have an app called Zoom. It's Z-U-M, though, and we use that, and it's pretty much on spot on on what's going on. They don't have the robocalls, but they do have the Zoom app, and it's working for everybody right now. They just did it this year. Um, now, I'm a parent here at High Point. I'm a nurse, and I work in Howard County. I work in Howard County. I've worked in Montgomery County. Drug problem is everywhere. Howard County knows how to suppress theirs. I'll just say that. It's not that it's not happening everywhere. It is happening. We've had Narcan in our elementary schools for maybe two years now. And it's not only for the students, it's for the teachers too. Um, even parents we've had come to the school and 
bet you didn't hear about that. But those things do happen. I feel like with the students, it starts at home first. They're bringing pills to school, they're bringing weed, and they're telling us in the health room, we got it from our parent. So it's the parents also. They give these kids money, they have it in their homes. So it's not only, you know, what you were saying, we, they only spend a few hours a day. We, these are our kids. We have to take responsibility for our kids. We cannot keep blaming the school only for it. I want to commend Mr. Chacon, Dr. Taylor. Last year, my son had a gun pulled on him and so did his friend. His friend was afraid to speak up. My son spoke up, not exactly when it happened because they were getting threatened. This man and Dr. Taylor jumped into action. I mean, it was questioning, it was all kind of stuff, you know. They really tried to do their due diligence to make sure my son was safe, checking in on him. The resource officers would see him. You see anything? You're good, blah, 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 blah. So they are trying, but this school is huge. And there's kids all in the hallways packed in. And it's like, what do you do when it's only six of them to do something with all of these children? It is a lot. It is a lot for the parents. My son was nervous to come back to school but he was brave enough to come back because he said, well, they had metal detectors and so forth. Mm -hmm. I am from New York. We had metal detectors umpteen years ago. And guess what? We didn't move them. They were at every entrance. And also, we did have the dogs. So the dogs were at the doors. I, I mean, they're saying the dogs are going to die. No, it's not. When you go to the airport, they have the dogs at the airport. If that is something that y'all can instill, it would make a big difference on the drugs coming into the school. You know, I mean, the violence is the violence. There was a fight the first day of school here, you know, so kids are going to fight. Yep. But if they don't have knives and guns to go along with it, it's a tad bit safer for our kids. And I think we really need to take that seriously. I don't understand why it took so long for so many schools to get metal detectors. But I think the drug sniffing dogs will work because it worked when I went to school. Um, and I'm, that's all I wanted to give to you tonight. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Will you tilt that, tilt that down so we can hear yeah. you good and clear? Good evening. My name is Diana Jacobson. I was told to spell. I'm going to spell my last name, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N. Jacobs. I'm a math teacher at High Point High School. I'm very proud of it. I'm not going to say that we don't have issues like every other school in the whole country has issues. Mm -hmm. Fenton is not just innate to us. Everywhere. My concern is accountability. I'm not going to restate all the things that everybody has said, but I'm very proud of my, my class, I mean, my peers, my colleagues, my administrators that try their very best on the very dire circumstances. Our children try to survive on the very dire circumstances. This is a very impoverished community, and they don't really have a voting voice. They are very quiet, and that's why they get pushed over and pass along for all these new improvements and everything that everybody's getting. Because we, don't have, we are not a voting block. And she's right, this lady was right. We have to go out there and let the people know that we do have a voice, that we count. We might not be rich, we might not be super educated, but we, have, we love our children. Yep. And that's what we gotta focus. Now, talking about the drugs and the violence, I wanna know what are the consequences. Because let's say the assistant principal, the security guards, the teachers report the issues. They get the culprits. What happened to them? Why did they go back to the classroom? Why are they back at the school? I know students should be at a school, but not the ones that commit violence or using drugs because they're endangering everybody else around them. So the policy that we have in the code of conduct have become very weak, and with that, you have empowered all the, the, the students that really don't have the best interest or heart on being educated to do the things that they do because they know that there are no consequences. So you have an answer for that, I will be more happy to hear it. So first, first of all, thank you like I've thanked the other teachers. Thank you for your service and your support uh, of our teachers, uh, your colleagues. Uh, the, the goals that we want to accomplish for our students here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to have the answer of fixing, I think, uh, what you're expecting me to fix tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. This is going to be a community conversation today is about hearing the concerns, 
taking those concerns back over the course of uh, my entry plan so that I can plan moving forward on making the modifications and changes that need to uh, need to occur. So thank you for bringing that passion. We're documenting those things uh, as you're bringing them to the table so that we can address them. My main concern is that the policy have to be changed. Not to protect the people that, co that, go, that break the rules, yep. but to protect, protect the students that actually come to school to learn. Yep. That's what wouldn't be harassed or everything else that you are here happening. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for thank listening. Thank you. We appreciate you. Yes, ma'am. Buenas tardes a todos. Gracias a usted por estar aquí. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here today. Mi nombre es Francisca. F R A C A. I S C A. Y soy madre de un estudiante aquí en la escuela de High Point. Uh, my name is Francisca, F R A N C I S C A, and I am the mom of a student here in High Point. Yo pienso que High Point es una escuela muy importante para la comunidad. And I believe that High Point is a very important school for the community. Esta comunidad es muy buena. Uh, this community is very good. Y yo siempre he escuchado que Montgomery County es un, tienen escuelas mejores. Conozco muchas familias que se mudan allá porque las escuelas de allá son mejores que las de acá. Dicen así. Pero yo pienso que este county es muy bueno también y deberían ser las escuelas igual de buenas como en otros condados. And I believe that uh, this, this county is very good. Uh, I have family members who have said, or people who have said that Montgomery County is better. I have uh, family who have moved to Montgomery County because they said the schools over there are better. But I believe that this community or this county is good and that it should also have schools that are as good as Montgomery County schools. Yo tengo un hijo aquí en esta escuela y me preocupa mucho el problema de las drogas. Y yo sé que toda esta gente que trabaja aquí está haciendo lo mejor para mejorar y está haciendo muy bien. Uh, I have a son here who goes to this school and I'm very worried, concerned about the drug situation. And I know that all the faculty and all the people the, uh, who work here are doing their best to work on that area or, or work with that problem. Por eso, yo quiero que usted hoy escuche, y no solo escuche, sino que haga, porque la acción es lo que vale. Uh, which is why today I don't want you to just listen, but to also take action, uh, because the ac action is what makes the difference. Uh -huh. Y <laughs> creemos en sus promesas, y también Nosotros vamos a hacer lo mejor para ayudar a la escuela como padres. And we believe in your promises and we will also do our very best uh, as parents to help the school. Porque nuestros muchachos son importantes y son el futuro de este país. Because our children are very important and they are the future of this country. Absolutely. <coughs> y también... Um, Mi preocupación son los grados de los niños. ¿Cómo pueden ellos rendir si no hay maestro? Y hay millones de muchachos aquí, muchos niños y poco maestro. En uh, another worry that I have is regarding their grades or their uh, their grades, in which we know that there's a little bit of teachers and a lot of students. There's uh, millions of students or a lot of students, uh, but not enough teachers or not many teachers. Y necesitamos maestro y más empleado en esta escuela de emergencia. Es necesario. And we need uh, those teachers. We need those uh, teachers uh, in emergency. We need those staff. Y también yo he mirado que los niños que vienen a la escuela caminando tienen mucha dificultad para entrar a la escuela. Porque los carros 
cuando están cruzando la calle, eh, mi hijo camina para venir aquí. Y, y yo veo cuando vengo con él, cómo los carros pasan y es muy peligroso. And another worry is the cars. Uh, my child, he walks as well as I've seen other children who walk and they have to cross the street and I've seen how the cars are just going by and it can be very dangerous. Hello? No sé si puede, no sé, poner cámara para que los carros no vayan tan rápido porque es muy peligroso. Yo no quiero que le pase nada a mi hijo y a ningún otro niño de la comunidad. Y también quiero agradecerle a todos los maestros y a todos los que trabajan aquí por el aporte que hacen para la educación de mi hijo. Pero también quiero saber qué van a hacer para que los niños tengan mejor grado. Porque yo quiero que mi hijo vaya a la universidad. Esta escuela tiene muy mala reputación. And I'm not sure if it's possible to put a speeding camera or some kind of camera uh, to make sure that the students cross safely uh, because my student matters or I worry about my student as well as the other students crossing the streets. I also want to say thank you to all the teachers and the staff uh, for all the help that they've given, all the things that they've done. But at the same time, I want to know what uh, they're going to So I want to make sure that I uh, have it translated to her that We've heard her concerns. There, some of the concerns are very similar. I think it's the first time we heard the concerns in reference to students crossing the street. But I also heard her talk about action uh, as well. And that's a part of why we are here. I have to hear first. Uh, and that's why I'm doing the, the town halls throughout our community so that I can come back and move forward with action. We've heard loud and clear. And I want to make sure I hear from our last two to, uh, to parents and provide them with uh, adequate time to, uh, uh, to hear from as well. But thank you, uh, and we have heard you loud and clear, and we look forward to uh, moving forward with action to address many of the issues. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is uh, Stefan Brown, S-T-E-L-N. I uh, graduated out of here in 2005. My dad graduated here before me, and it's heartbreaking to hear these parents and concerned people of the community speak about uh, what's going on here. Um, my big concern is, like this young lady here said, she had to turn her son out because, of, because he plays sports. It's a lot of kids and other areas that play sports who are in the trans world being held back because um, because of our athletic directors and other people on the board not approving transfers. Hence, these students have been transferred to schools since the end of last year. Currently, we have issues when it comes to the sports, uh, uh, the football teams primarily. Um, for Right now, our biggest concern is having medical staff available to them on the sidelines. Uh, we don't have anybody there to protect them. If these kids get hurt with concussions or anything that could be life-threatening to them, there's nobody there to mm -hmm. assist them on the field. From our understanding, we was piggybacking off of Montgomery County's with MedStar last year, and all we had to do was go back in and get the, real, get the approval for this season. We have nobody at these games. It's, we're going into week five, and there's not one medical staff on the sideline for these games. What are we going to do to protect our kids? One of the things that we did, and we, I heard this concern uh, when, I, uh, when I came in early on in the job, so we moved forward to uh, work with uh, the fire department, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the fire department is serving as the medical personnel. We put together a contract specifically uh, with the fire department to have them on site to provide medical care. Uh, if needed uh, at, uh, at, our, at our football games and athletic events. So that is something that was a, um, a planned action uh, because of um, the, the lack of contract or whatever it was that did not occur. So we have moved forward with a, a contract that's been signed, executed, and uh, moved forward with, uh, with our fire department. Okay. Yep. And my last question. 
there are certain high schools here who have strong sports programs that are being targeted because there are students who want to transfer into those schools because of the possibility of being recruited and being able to get scholarships to get to college. A lot of us can't afford to send our <coughs> kids to college out of our pocket. A lot of our kids can't sit up here and go to a high point where there's only 13 kids on the team, nobody's in the stands to watch mm -hmm. them play. So they're going to transfer to other schools. What are we going to do to help benefit these kids who are looking for opportunity out of this area and be stronger and be better and be, and be able to provide for themselves moving forward? Especially the ones who use athlete, um, athletics as that avenue. Yeah, as that avenue. Yeah. You know, for so myself, I graduated out of here. Like I said, I graduated out in 2005. I had eight scholarship offers, but that's also back when those stands was full of people every mm -hmm. Friday night under the lights. Um, nowadays, last year I walked in here, my dad and uh, five of us, it was 12 people in the stands for homecoming. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is, a, is a former college athlete. I went to school on a full uh, full ride to to play basketball. Go figure. I'm five nine, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was definitely an avenue uh, that allowed me to to see the country and see the world. Some experiences that I might not have, and uh, dearly appreciated. But one of the things that attracts athletes um, is number one culture, leadership, and facilities. Uh, those are a few of the things that we know uh, attract uh, great athletic programs. And, uh, and those are the things that I think uh, we will be working towards, whether it's through our P3, uh, whether it's through uh, our, uh, our entry plan and our action in terms of making certain that we uh, uh, do what's best for our children from an academic standpoint and an athletic standpoint as well in building the culture to be proud of, uh, of what it is to, to be a student in this school and in others. So definitely hear your concern and, uh, and, and duly note it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Betsy Palma. Eh, cuando entré, me dijeron que dijera dos respuestas. Eh, una, de que estoy orgullosa. Me siento eh, orgullosa de los maestros, del personal, los coaches. So, mi papá es maestro también en mi país. So, yo sé lo que los maestros pasan en las escuelas. El, el difícil y duro trabajo que tienen que hacer con tanto niño. Eh, ese es uno de los orgullos que yo puedo decir que tengo de todos los maestros y del trabajo que hacen. Y... Ok, uh, good afternoon. My name is Betsy, Bet Betsy Palma. And when I walked in, they asked me to share two things, uh, two things that I'm proud of, or uh, two answers. And I, one of the things was that I'm proud of the staff, the teachers, uh, all the things that they've done. My dad is also a teacher back in my country, so mm -hmm. I'm very proud of all the... I've been, I'm very proud of everything that they've done. La paciencia que ellos tienen con todos los estudiantes. Um, y la otra es de lo que me dijeron que podían mejorar ustedes aquí. So, es uno de mis um, preguntas es que pueden mejorar con la seguridad, porque hace dos semanas mi hijo estudia aquí, fue agredido por un seguridad y la base de la, la agresión fue porque mi hijo no respondió su nombre. So, eso es um, parte de lo que yo enseño en mi casa, pero a veces los niños, o, eh, no sé, a veces pasan cosas que no, no tienen que pasar y se agrandan las cosas. No sé por qué, porque los adultos tenemos que enseñar cosas buenas a nuestros hijos y, y estudiantes, pero el, la seguridad aquí está un poco mala. El policía le dijo a mi hijo que por qué me había llamado a mí, que eso no era necesario. Cuando yo vine aquí a la escuela, el policía me dijo que no habían, las cámaras de, no estaban buenas y dijo eso no era necesario. Y le dije yo, ¿cómo no va a ser necesario que un security le pegue a mi hijo y le escupa la cara y le diga muchas palabras abusivas de mí y de su persona de él. Entonces, cuando yo vine, el policía dijo que porque le habíamos, me había llamado, y yo le, le enseñé un video que anda en las redes sociales donde está y se ve cómo escupen la cara de mi hijo y le pegan. So, yo vine aquí a decir eso porque también me preocupa Miles de estudiantes 
y está solo el auditorio y por eso a veces nuestras voces no son escuchadas. And, and I also want to say also thanks to the teachers and the staff with, for the patience that they have uh, for their children. Uh, the next thing they asked me to write was uh, about what I want to see uh, like improve or what can be improved. Mm -hmm. And that comes, uh, my there comes my question regarding uh, security. What can be improved with the security? Because I have a son who goes to the school and he was assaulted by one of the security guards uh, in which he was... Uh, And uh, basically, the reason he was assaulted by the security guard was because he wasn't answering to his name, or he wasn't. Okay. And the reason why he did that uh, was because uh, the, the the security guard was asking for like was like asking for his name or trying to get a response out of him, and he didn't say anything. Uh, so the security guard assaulted him, spit on him, and also said a bunch of bad words towards him. And uh, then. Uh, he got to communication with with, my, with with me. He got to communication with me, and uh, the security guard told told my son why he had called me. So I came to the school and I asked uh, to to see what had happened. But they said that the the cameras weren't working, um, and uh, I was confused. I asked that that's not possible. I said that that's not possible. But they said that the cameras weren't working, and. Uh, uh, I was basically wondering why he, he spit on him and why he was saying these bad words or these things towards me or towards him. And I also have a video that's circulating around social media showing where the security guard is spitting on my son. Well, I think it's important to, to share that information uh, with, with the school district so that the proper, uh, if we have not done so, I don't know how recent this is, the proper investigation uh, can uh, can be done so uh, we can make certain to to follow up on that the assistant principals here and we'll make sure make sure that uh, the proper uh, investigation is done so thank you also for honoring uh, your teachers uh, administrators and uh, the comments that you've made what I uh, uh, they're doing what they're what's possible I didn't hear you Uh, and they're, at the school, they're doing everything that's possible to deal with the situation. But because they asked me to like uh, share something that I'd like to see improved and also something I'm proud of, that's what thank I, I want to share. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And I want to thank you all for, for being here this evening. Give yourselves a big hand. We appreciate the feedback. A lot of times as a leader, uh, it's important not only to hear the things that are going well, but in my opinion, a good leader opens his ears for the things that are not going well uh, also. Uh, so thank you for sharing your hearts. Thank you especially to the students that stepped in and spoke today. I'm looking forward, um, peer, peer lead, thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to doing this um, three or four more times and getting as much feedback as we move forward to make this the best school district that, uh, that we want to make it. Uh, I want to challenge each of you uh, before you leave, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, and I want you to translate this piece if you don't mind, uh, if you haven't had a chance to go out and see the resources uh, that are here, we've asked several individuals from our district office uh, that have different resources to support you, to support our students. Please stop at a table, stop at two tables, stop at three tables, so you can get a chance to see what we're doing to be able to support our community and what is important to ensure that our students have what's necessary to be successful. With that being said, good night and thank you for being here.